think outside the box, if you will. I mean, go there, go off campus. Let's think this through. And sure enough, that's where the Mustang was born. When it finally hit, it took the country by storm. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Cars in Context. I'm your host, John Clore. You know, this is the Motor City, and this is the show that we bring cars into the context of your everyday life. We're going to try to give you some real insight into the auto industry, and it's the, the world of cars. But we're also not going to make any apologies for my decidedly Detroit perspective. You know, today I've got a really great show for those of you who like to go cruising in the summertime, who like to get new cars, trade new cars, and get classics and bring them in and out of storage, get them ready for the road for a, f a full summer of summer fun cruising Woodward or Harper or uh, Gratiot or wherever you want to cruise. So today we've got a great show on classic car storage tips. We've brought in none other than our own favorite automotive expert, Joe Babiaz. Joe, welcome to Cars in Context again. Hi, John. How are you? Good to it's see great, you. It's great to have you back. We've got a really good topic, especially this time of year. You know, there's some things you can do right or wrong, and it's really going to help people if they pay attention to the ways to get your car back on the road, especially some of these really old cars. Absolutely. But before we do that, it's time for finding out what's been in the news. So, Joe, I'll take the first one here. All right. Now, folks, remember we've been talking to you for a while about the fewer traffic deaths that have been happening on our nation's highways over the last several years. Well, part of that reason can come to the simple fact that Americans are driving many, many fewer miles these days. Now, why is that? Well, a recent report from the U.S. Public Interest Research Group says that the average miles driven has been declining for eight years in a row now. Eight wow. consecutive years. The miles driven per capita peaked back in 04. And the average American now drives for the same number of miles as they did back in the mid-1990s. So now the experts say the decline is likely to continue because us baby boomers, we do most of the driving. We love driving. But we're retiring and we're getting off the roads while millennials, who are driving the fewest miles of any generation of any age group in America, are starting to get their licenses and come online so they're not replacing those miles. Now the report says the government needs to spend its time on fixing the roads instead of expanding them. But we're going to put this one in context. The real reason, folks, while these, these numbers are declining, it is the economy. Gas prices have an effect on how much we tool around just for fun. It really does matter. And it, the, more, the higher the gas prices, the more difficult it is for, to justify spending money just driving around for the evening. Right, but I think another thing is the, the young people today, they don't look at cars the way we look at, look oh, at cars. No. And there's a large uh, group of people that they don't want to have a car. They want to live in the city. They want to use mass transit. Of course, in Detroit, that's a bit of a problem. <laughs> Good luck. But that's, I think, another reason why this, this number is dwindling. Yeah, it really is. Which is, by the way, we're going to do a whole show on that, Joe, and you're going to have to come back. We'll talk about yeah, that sure. whole reason. Uh, listen, why don't you take a news item? I bet you it's one of the news items you know a lot about. I know a little bit about it. It's about the, uh, the Packard plant, the, oh, yeah. uh, the infamous Packard plant on the corner of Concord and uh, and the East uh, East Grand Boulevard. Right. So if you're driving down 94, you get off at what, Mount Elliott? And yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's right at, on, on that corner. And uh, it was built in 1903, designed wow. by Albert Kahn, yep. you know, world-famous des designer. Uh, peaked at over three and a half million square feet of floor space. Wow. And uh, built Packards there until about 1956. Uh, mm -hmm. at, at that point, they moved to another facility in, on Connor Boulevard. Mm -hmm. uh, after it closed, a number of businesses went in, yep. and uh, now uh, the, their businesses are gone, and the plant is for sale. So if anybody wants to buy, <laughs> Who the, wants Packard, to buy the Packard plant, wants to buy the Packard plant, it's for sale. Uh, they'll have an auction in September, okay. and they, they're they going to try to sell it as one parcel. They, the broke it, they broke it up into 43 parcels, but they want to try to sell it. Uh, it, it, you know, as one unit for with a minimum bid of nine hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars for the entire for the entire facility, so which you really is I mean, the, yeah. That's the, a kind of a deal, the, I guess. Yeah, of course, because <laughs> it's an Albert Con building, it's almost impossible to tear it down. <laughs> you can reinforce concrete. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, so it's the, it's going to be on auction in September. If they mm. don't meet minimum bid, they'll break it up into forty-three parcels. Try to sell it piecemeal and sell it for as little as five hundred dollars a parcel. 
oh my which goodness. would bring in to the city about $21,500, not very much money at all. No. But, you know, it's, a, it's an iconic building. Um, it's a shame to see it go. There is a part of it that's still in pretty good shape that was uh, built during the war efforts. Mm -hmm. Uh, but maybe Joe, we can is, save part of it. Detroit has tried to sell the Packard plant two or three times before. What makes this one so different? You really think this is going to go this time? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, the building is in pretty bad shape for the most part. Yeah. There's one section that's not, but most of it's in pretty sad shape. Folks, if you hadn't uh, watched us when Joe came and did an entire show on the Packard plant, and he visited the ruins and went and went to the archives and saw pictures of it back then, and then went back and visited it more recently, we have our show on uh, the Detroit's Packard plant on our Cars in Context TV YouTube channel. Make sure you check it out there. Well, Joel, I'm going to take one. Um, many of you may not know this, but Ford Motor Company has been making cars in Australia since way back in 1928. They've been building, manufacturing cars in Australia. But it looks like all that will be over in the land down under. That's because just recently uh, Ford announced they're going to stop producing automobiles in Australia in the year 2016. Now the reason for that is they're saying the cost of building cars in Australia about double of the cost of building a car in Europe, and they're about four times of the cost of building cars in, in the Ford's Asian uh, factories. But automakers were actually doomed in Australia the minute they let the imports in. Because what's happened is the imports flooded their market with cheaper cars that were built overseas, especially, you know, with the, the yen a difference, and they pretty much put the volume of cars sold uh, by their domestic industry to such a small unit, they can't be profitable. So it's really happened that they, they don't have enough uh, local domestic volume to support manufacturing in their own country. It happened in England. They don't have manufacturing there. I mean, once they let open the doors for the imports who got a, a deal on uh, the trade balance, it, they doomed their own industry. You know, there's a lesson there. To somewhere. be learned, absolutely. And I think we and we, we did, did a show on <laughs> we uh, did. Yes, uh, we did. fair trade isn't fair. It's another yeah. one you can watch on the YouTube channel. But Joe, that's a sad it's day because you know some of those old Australian yeah. cars. Now, like GM still builds cars there. We do. We do. We build a version of what, what was the Pontiac uh, G8 and is going. Oh, is the new the new Impala. Oh yeah, the, the, yeah. the new Impala is based off the Australian. Right, and uh, Ford had those those uh, Utes that were like uh, Rancheros oh, yeah. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, for you guys to be El Caminos. Yeah, and they did uh, the Falcon cars, big V8 cars, you know, the rear drive. They love the tradition. They love that. But uh, I'll be front drive imports pretty soon. It's kind of sad. But it's history. Why don't you take another one, Joe? Okay, well, you've heard of the rent to own. You know, you can rent to own, oh. a, you can rent to own a, a television <laughs> set, a couch. Well, now you can rent to own your tires. No, no, Joe, come on. You no, can. no, I, I, the rims you, you can do. You, you, your, no, you can, your wheels. I mean, your, your wheels, you can rent to own your, your wheels. Because uh, I know some of those rims are like chrome spinning 22s are five six thousand dollars, but you're saying the the tires now? Well, yeah, absolutely. Oh my god! Absolutely, you can rent to own the tires. You can rent to own the tires and wheel combination. As an example, out in L.A., uh, as cheap as fourteen dollars a week, you can you can rent them. Uh, so why if you don't have, like, want to rent them, I guess if you don't well, have the money. Well, if you don't have five thousand dollars, you need tires. Uh, so I can write a check for fourteen uh, dollars. I, I, I guess you could, except when by the time you get done paying yeah. renting them, uh -huh. you find out you're winding up paying about two or three times you would have <laughs> if you wound up buying them in the first place. Your checks will last longer so, than the and, tires. And, and you have to make sure you pay on time because if you don't pay on time, in some states, the companies have the right to uh, take your car back and oh my until gosh. you pay for it. So. Oh, what, what, that is just terrible. Yep. Why, why, why right. are we forced into doing that? I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I guess if you can't afford, well, I know it, you tire, can't afford it. When we but, let Chinese but, tires in the country, the price of the tires jumped. Yep. And now the tires, folks. I don't know if you've priced your tires lately, but getting a set of tires used to be three, four hundred dollars. It's seven, eight hundred dollars. Yep. So That's it's true. double the cost. So, ugh. well, I'm not going to be renting mine anytime Nor soon. Nor am I. All right. Well, I've got one for you. How about the, you know, the, all the headlines we've been reading, folks, and seeing on television about the Feds looking into our phone and our email records? Well, there's another crazy story out of La La Land out there on the West Coast. The American Civil Liberties Union. You know, some of the, the craziest lawyers in the country have apparently filed a lawsuit against the biggest. Uh, police departments out in Los Angeles. And the reason they're doing that is because these police departments are collecting information the, off these scanners that scan license plates and immediately check the plates for uh, a criminal database. So they can tell you from a car that they're driving past you or they're driving on the freeway immediately if you if the car's been stolen or if uh, there's you, a felony, uh, whatever, whatever. It might be. So apparently the ACLU <laughs> doesn't really mind that they have no problem with them that they're checking these cars for criminal 
the, the, against the database. That's not the problem. The problem is these scanners actually hold the information for up to five years. Oh. And they're saying, well, that while they're hanging on to the information, something, happens something, something could happen where your personal uh, yeah. data may be compromised, and that's where they have the problem. They said, uh, and yet, they can't get these public records as public to find out how many are being held. Why, Joe? Because once it's scanned and the police have it, it's an investigative data. You can't, the, the, uh -huh. it, it's protected. So this material can't be released as in the public domain. So the ACLU wants government to go, you can do scanners, but erase this stuff immediately. If the driver or the car is not connected to any crime, let it go. This is you know, Joe, scary. This you is gotta scary, love John. the lawyers, don't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't love the lawyers. For you me, lawyers I don't, out there, I don't love the lawyers. So we'll, I'm sure there are some good ones out there. Send us but a I'm, note. We'll, we'll give good. you our apology. Uh, you know, that's about what we have for the news. We're going to come back, back and put Joe in the driver's seat. We're going to talk about the best way to get your collector car either out of storage or into storage. Get ready for the cruise season right after this. Great. Hi, and welcome back to Cars in Context. I'm your host, John Clore. Today I've got with us our famous, our world famous automotive historian and author, well, thanks, Joe Bob. Yes, thanks for coming hey, out to Cars pleasure, in Context. John. Good to see I've you. had Joe on the show many times. He, you know, it's, he's, he's one of our favorites today uh, because of Joe's work in the collector car world and, uh, and his knowledge of this. We're going to talk to Joe, put him in the driver's seat, and talk to us about how to get your collector car out of storage, no matter, or even if you're shopping for one and it's been in the storage. What you got to do to get the car road ready and get it out there for that Woodward Dream Cruise, the Gratiot Cruise, the Telegraph Cruise, the Down River Cruise, Harper Cruise, whatever cruise. Really, it's a really important thing because the cars don't, uh, they don't just sit there and run perfectly forever. I mean, the, so Joe, let's get right, right to it. Um, let's say we've got a couple of viewers out there who are either thinking of buying a collector car for this cruise season and it's been sitting in somebody's garage for a while, or they have their own, the weather's turning nice, so they're going back there and they're going to pull the cover off. What's the first thing you, you do when you're going to get a collector car out of a storage, if it's winter rest? Well, John, you really want to do first do a uh, safety inspection on the car, first and foremost. Over the winter, things, you know, things, leaks can happen, uh, <laughs> leak can occur, and uh, a brake cylinder, wheel mm -hmm. cylinder can, uh, can start leaking. You want to make sure that the, the car is safe, so pull your wheels and tires off and your, your brakes, check all your fluids. Uh, if you do your homework in the winter, you do the work in the winter to set it up for storage, uh -huh. you won't have to do a whole lot in the spring in terms of the engine, and any performance or tune up if you if you recently tuned the car up. Okay. Uh, if you change your oil just before the winter and it's, and it's in storage, you can, that oil is still okay to use right. in the spring and summer. Right. So it really depends so on what you've done. The, put, more, you, the mm -hmm. more you do for your winter storage, the less you're going to have mm -hmm. to do when you take it out of storage. Okay, well folks, that's a, a perfect advice. First of all, when you get to the garage, even if it's the car you don't even know anything about you pull that cover off the car a visual inspection this is the first thing you need to do look under the car i know when uh one of my cars was stored i you know pulled the cover off it looked great i always look inside the car to make sure uh, rodents didn't get in it and little you know but under the car i saw a little pool of uh, oil and sure enough uh, the, uh, one of the hoses on the power steering line uh, developed a leak and leaked mm -hmm. all it was all out i mean right. and so when i came to get the car i had to have things like oil and fluids and you know bring the power steering fluid with you uh, it's always a good thing to take the, the wheels off and check things like that as well. So sure. roll it out. And, and yeah, as you said, check your fluids. So certainly check all your fluids. Now, I, I don't know about uh, most people do store their cars. We've been telling you on the show before when Joe's been on, when you go to store your car to fill up the gas tank, don't empty the gas tank. Fill it up and put a good quality uh, stabilizer, stabilizer in the fl fluid. Absolutely. That way your gas will still work. in the. So Joe, if a car has been sitting all winter, do you recommend putting it on a battery tender or how do you keep the battery, you take the batteries out? How do you get that car started for the first time? Well, I, you know, I'd recommend you take the battery out, put it in your basement, keep it in, a, in at least a dry, warm place, uh, maybe on top of a block of wood. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to take your battery out, put a battery tender on it, which is a very low uh, battery charger. Yes, yeah, not uh, a trickle charger, because those are just continually right. charged. We could boil right. a battery. These right. are... Um, 
these are uh, solid state. They they know when the battery needs when juice. It needs it, and and it give it, it only only when it needs so only really when it needs some juice. So you can do that. But you also want to consider disconnecting your battery cable. Right. You know. But again, I'd prefer taking your battery out completely. I would just take it out, put it in your basement. Okay. Uh, you know, clean your cables for the springtime. Make sure they're nice and clean. And, oh, so you go back and to storage and ready. Yeah, it's it ready should to go. be ready. Your battery should be okay, even if the battery sits four or five months. A lot of, most batteries, if they were good when they went out right. of the car, they're going to be good going back in the car. So you take you go to your storage unit, put the battery in. You check for all your fluids before you turn the key. Certainly. Okay. Yep, absolutely. And then you get in, you fire yeah, it up. Fire any up any any tricks to that? No, just you know, fire it up, but you don't take it right out. Let it warm up a few minutes. Certainly, you know, these are old cars, and they're <laughs> not like today's fuel injection units. The carburetors are a little sensitive. The seals uh, get a little dry. Just, yeah, exactly. Get the get the oil, get the fluids running in the car. Take it out for a spin, and then after you've driven it a short time, take it out for a little test spin. Bring it back. Look back under your car. Right. See if any anything started to leak from there. But you can. The, a lot of these the, these uh, seals are very very old <laughs> and what didn't leak five minutes ago can leak now this is probably the best piece of advice you're going to oh. get from the show joe I, you're right you're, the, a lot of people they take the cover off the car they go there they get it started right and then they go drive it home they drive it yeah. home big mistake Bad folks idea. what you Bad need to idea. do is once you get the cover it's starting it's been running for a few minutes you're walking around nothing seems to be out of ordinary take it for a slow drive in the neighborhood do not get it on the freeway you're taking it for your the, the tires could be flat spotted you're looking for li, li, don't play the radio don't talk to yeah, anyone listen, listen to the listen car for, yes. you're listening for noises uh, there may be some uh, rotor rubbing on the brakes because it's been sitting for so long but drive it around 5 10 15 20 minutes or just around a block or yeah. two away so if something happens you're within earshot of your garage then you go back and as joe says that's the time turn it off go back around the car over Take again. another good look now around. you'll see open the hood get the flashlight out and that's the and air up the tires because they've been sitting too if, if you haven't had the car up on blocks what's the big thing about cars up on blocks well you know there's no real right or wrong thing a lot of guys will take the car and um, put it on put it on blocks take the tires off <laughs> Um, it prevents a flat spot on the tire, but that'll mm -hmm. normally work itself out yeah. if you drive the car a little bit. Uh, I will say one thing as, as a safety or as a, a, uh, a thing about the not getting, getting your car stolen, if your car's up on blocks right. um, and some, you know, you're away for a week, you're on vacation, somebody can get in your garage and pull your car out of the garage, but if it's up on blocks and the tires <laughs> are off of it, Chances are it's going to be there unless they're spending an hour, put or half an hour putting the tires on the car. Okay. So there's no real right or wrong. Well, reason. and if conversely, you want to do it, that's great. conversely, some people say, well, that uh, if you have a fire, you can not get your you car. Can't get it. You get your car is going to stay in that garage. So, so there's some, no real right, no right answer. So folks, that old adage of you put your car on blocks. Well, you know, some, you unload the suspension and the, the shocks are in a different spot. It's okay to roll your car in. The, the trick is, it's where your car is being stored. Most of us store their cars in an unheated garage. So you want to be on concrete or you don't want to be you on dirt be. or on place because what happens is, well, even on concrete, there's but moisture. You, you, you really you, need to put a tarp down. John, you want, not a tarp, a plastic, yeah, heavy plastic, piece of plastic. plastic. You want to prevent that weeping of the moisture from yeah. coming up from the floor. Get, so would that, get that car so that what, uh, underneath the car, you're not getting moisture that's getting into the car because that yeah, does affect very important. The, yeah really so once you, so you you know when you back the car out first make sure you remember that you're on plastic and you must, you'll spin the car out of the garage you know don't take <laughs> off but those are really important tips you know first of all make sure that you put when you put the car away it's stabilized gasoline fill the tank up Major, a lot of people don't uh, change the oil before they change it in the spring and I guess Joe that's okay to go as soon as you get the car back home you can take it in and have a service yeah you know it really doesn't it, it doesn't matter either way most of these cars are not driven very often right. you know they're, they're driven 500 miles in a year or something like that, or maybe a thousand miles in the summertime um, so some guys will change the oil in the, in the fall and that's okay and mm -hmm. that oil is good in the spring yeah. some guys might want to wait till the spring it's not going to create a problem in the engine right. just make sure you have oil in there make sure all your fluids have been filled, filled up before you pull it in the garage right right you know, these are really good ideas, but Joe, here's the one that a lot of people ask me about, and I say, you know, uh, a lot, as you say, a lot depends on what you've done to the car before you put it away. What if you're buying a car, you want to go out and you found a, a car on Craigslist or on eBay, or a friend is selling you their car, you don't know what's been done to that car. A lot of people say it's been stored two, three, four years. Now we're getting into some issues where uh, don't expect the air conditioning to work. Why is that? Well, the, you'll get some leakage. I mean, the, 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 there seals, are seal, the seals will dry up if the, if the AC hasn't been run on a regular basis. There's oil within the system. The old AC systems the old, the old actually AC sealed systems them. Have, have an, you know, they have oil within them, and, they, and you need to run those things on occasion. If it hasn't run for four years, chances are some of the R12, with the old-fashioned uh, AC, 
uh, will have let out and it probably will not work. Okay. What about the trick of oh, taking a spark plug out? It's been sitting so long and squirting oil in the cylinder. Is that necessary? Uh, it, really, it really depends. I mean, I've bought, I've had cars where they sat 15 years and I've fired them up and they ran good. But I, I have put, in those cases, I have pulled the plugs out. I put, um, I like Marvel Mystery Oil. Okay. Oh, I put yeah. Marvel Mystery Oil in there, let it soak for a day or two, and then you know, crank the engine without the plugs in it to get the oil out throw some plugs in it, and then it's going to fire up. Wow. So there's, it's not a bad thing to put some oil in there. Uh, and if it's possible, to hand crank the motor first before yes. you do it with Spin the starter. Spin it around, yeah. If you can turn it with the, with, the, uh, with the fan blade, and if it's a stick shift, put it in first gear yeah. and move the car. That's a great And that'll idea. break any, any uh, rust uh, that might be in the ring, between the rings and the cylinder walls. Really good idea. Okay, so now, folks, you've got this car running. You've taken it home. You, maybe you've taken it to your favorite uh, repair shop. They've given it a safety inspection. And you're out cruising Woodward. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, um, I don't follow a regular maintenance schedule because I don't put 3,000 miles between all. I mean, not get 3,000 miles in the summer. What about things like antifreeze? How do you know what the schedule is, the maintenance schedule? Good, you know, good point. Antifreeze is a good example. Uh, most of the the older cars use the old uh, ethylene glycol antifreeze. Oh, yeah. They don't use the new extended. Uh, 100,000 mile antifreeze, and that should really be changed every three years really? at the most, regardless Rather of the, the miles? miles. Regardless of the miles, hmm. every 36 months you should put in fresh antifreeze. Um, it, it, and you're not going to use most of the cars. They're not going to put the, the newer antifreeze in there. So no. if you use an ethylene glycol, three years, if you put 500 miles on it, still change it. Wow. Okay, well, Good to do. There's lubricant in there. You know, have, there's there's there are chemicals in that antifreeze that break down eventually, and you want to make sure you have the fresh stuff in there. I mean, know, it's, I, it's an investment you're I, dealing with. I'm 100 percent with you, folks. I actually saw a guy who was uh, cruising in his car, and I saw his little oil change sticker from like five, six years ago. And I said, you should still put your new oil change sticker. He goes, well, I haven't changed the oil because I haven't put 5,000 miles on it. Oh, I go, oh, That's not good. No, so oil changes. Some guys that uh, have a classic car, drive it a few hundred miles in the summer, they would like to change their oil every year. You really should. Okay, so I mean, it's, it's cheap. Just because it's you didn't have insurance. Yeah. I mean, it's cheap insurance. Fortunately, collector cars, for the most part, go up in value. So you're you're driving an investment. You're not just driving a car, right. and you you want to take care of that investment. And so for the fifteen to twenty dollars it costs you for an oil and filter, it's cheap insurance. Just every year change it. Change it in the fall, or change it in the spring, but change it every year. For those of you out there who have that collector car, let's say the parts are hard to come by. You know, this is why you're buying these parts. You, I, it's not a bad idea to, to, to when you see these parts on eBay or uh, at a swap meet to buy them up and put them in your Absolutely. garage because you want to keep that car roadworthy as long as you can. Joe, this is fan fantastic advice. I want you guys all to follow it, and we want to see you out at a cruise around the Detroit area following this very good advice. Joe, thanks again for That's this good. great information. My but pleasure, it, John. Believe great it or not, it's time for one of my favorite segments on the show, Joe, and that is Pride in My Ride. Folks, if you have a car that you have pride in, you can send it to me, Jay Clark, Cars and Context. We'll get it on the air. Today's Pride in My Ride is brought to us by none other than Joe Bavias. Joe, what is our Pride in My Ride car for this time? I'm sure. This is a real interesting car, and it's a real interesting guy. Charlie Van Acker of New Hudson, Michigan. This is a 93XR7, you know, the old rotary engine. Yeah. The well, this thing doesn't go, hmm, this thing goes rump, rump. <laughs> it's powered by a LS1 Corvette no engine way. with a six-speed transmission. Unbelievable. It is an unbelievable, unbelievable oh, car. Man, look at that. Uh, it weighs 2,500 pounds. It has 370 rear wheel horsepower. No. It does a quarter mile at 12 4 at 117 miles an hour, and it goes around corners like a roller skate. No, I mean, this thing is, is unbelievable. What's interesting is Charlie is, is well, let's just say he's older than I am. You expect a 25 year old guy to be getting out of that car. Oh, yeah. Uh, but Charlie uh, is still uh, enjoying enjoying it. He, he blames his, his, his dad a little bit for his desire oh. to have this car because his dad used to race in Indy between uh, 46 and oh, 1950, really? was an Indy driver. Oh, wow. Uh, and he also uh, wants to mention that he's, he's fortunate to have a wife that lets him buy things like that. He found the car on eBay, <laughs> it didn't meet reserve, and he wound up getting it after that. And it's just a crazy car. It's so a guy that has a car like this it can it can qualify for the senior citizens menu. He's well into the senior citizens menu, and uh, I mean it's a, it's an awesome car. It's an, you should hear this oh, thing. That is so cool. It is such a cool the, ride. Folks, don't judge a book by its cover. If you thought that car was driven by a 25 year old no. who, uh, <laughs> he, who uh, Charlie thinks he's a 25 year old. Oh, that's okay. That's really cool. I'd really like to have another one like that, folks. So send it in. Jay Clark, Cars and Context. Tell me why you have pride in your ride 
and uh, we'll be sure to get it on the air. You know, uh, it's also time for another favorite of our segments on Cars and Context, and that is viewer mail. Let's ask Lauren Parrott, our floor manager here at WMTV. Lauren, do we have any viewer mail for Cars and Context? Of course you have viewer mail. Oh, my goodness, we my have goodness. it again. How do we keep doing thank it, Lauren? You. People love your show. Well, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Lauren Parrott here at WMTV has brought us a couple of winners here. Well, I can see these are going to be tough. So, Joe, I'm going to let you answer the first viewer mail. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this one uh, comes to us from Rick G. of Gross Point Shores, who watches mm -hmm. Cars in Context on Comcast Cable 9, 915. Well, we're in HD then. Uh, dear Joe, I saw a report on the Wall Street, in the Wall Street Journal saying mm -hmm. that GM's Cadillac division had received permission from the Chinese government to begin building a $1.3 billion assembly plant yeah, in, in, China. In, in China. Yeah, I saw that. Where it is one complete, the facility will have the capacity to produce 150 vehicles per year. My what? question is, why Cadillac? I thought the favorite American luxury car in China was Buick. Yeah, what well, gives? That, that's right. Uh, Buick is their favorite, so if they can build 150,000 cars there, why would they want to is, is, do you know what they're going to build there? Well, I, I don't know what, what they're going to build. Right now, they only, they only have one plant building Cadillacs, and they, they build the XTS. Uh, General Motors is on a mission to get 10% uh, of the luxury car market in China, and they're going to do it with the new, with the, the new Cadillac, the additional Cadillacs coming right. on board. Well. They, they want to triple Cadillac sales, and they're going to work very, very hard to do that. Uh, although they, there's been a downturn in the luxury uh, oh, yeah. uh, market in China recently, but this is one case where GM has always been criticized for looking short term. Yeah. Well, here they're looking long term. They know short term things are a little bumpy right now. They believe that the new product line between Buick and Cadillac, they want to get 10% of the premium. They car should, they, I think that's a good idea. They can, you know, Lincoln's going to be over there too. Uh, why not? Go for it, guys. And a new market, uh, sell a U.S. design car there. Good idea. Absolutely. Well, I've got one, too, as well here. Uh, this piece of viewer mail comes from us from Lisa C. She lives in St. Clair Shores, and she watches Cars in Context on WOW Cable, Channel 10, uh, for you WOW subscribers. And she says, Dear John, she sent me a Dear John letter. She said, I saw your show on Fair Trade Isn't Fair. Remember that show? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yes. and was so stunned to know that the Asian automakers have exploited our free market for so many. Yes. No kidding. Yes, that's why we did yeah, the show, really. Lisa. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell me who is driving Japan's entry into this new Trans-Pacific Partnership, knowing full well that it could be so damaging to our auto industry. Joe, <laughs> Lisa, this is why we have Cars in Context. Um, the, the politicians are driving because they're yes. into the political aspects of that relationship. They could really care less about the business guy end of it because it's not their deal. That is a and this they, is and they can stop it. They, they can. choose they choose not to stop. This it. has been the reason why we've had this fair trade issue for all these years. The politicians set it up without talking to our in, and and caring really a whole lot about the industry. They felt it's good for their political standing to have this international deals with everyone. It's hurting us, folks. It really is. And until the trans, I, you know, we read the Trans Pacific uh, deal. It's not a good deal, especially that. The yen, the manipulation and of the yen. Yes. Some of these cars, uh, especially the Japanese and the Asian makes, can enjoy up to a fifteen hundred dollar advantage over just the currency exchange. So that means everybody's car, competitive product, is at a fifteen hundred dollar disadvantage right off the bat. So it's got nothing to do with quality. It's got nothing to do with you know whose car is better. It's and they also they put in regulations that that would they know will cost us a lot of money yeah. in addition to the, the, the yes. 15 percent so the whole thing uh, the, the thing that the manipulation of the, the currency is a, it's, it's a horrible thing folks stay and pay attention to this write your congressman America's car industry can put can stand up against the best in the world Absolutely. but we have to have a level playing field so definitely pay attention to this I really think uh, what, what's going to prevail it's going to be people getting involved and you know caring about uh, having an industry to, to care about because in other countries, it actually it went away. Joe, it was another great show. We're out of time again. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, thanks for coming by. Look we'll for, do a couple more uh, again. wonderful shows with Joe Babias. Make sure you tune in if you missed some of our shows. Check us out on Cars and Context TV on the YouTube channel. Uh, folks, again, just remember until next time that knowledge is power. I've been your host, John Clore. Thanks for watching.